is outnumbered on Sandra Smith. And here today, Fox Business Network's Dagan McDowell. Also from FBN, co-anchor of After the Bell, Melissa Francis. Former deputy spokesperson for the State Department and Fox News analyst, Marie Harf is here. And joining us on the couch today, Lieutenant Colonel Michael Waltz, retired U.S. Army. He is a former Green Beret commander and was counterterrorism advisor to Vice President Dick Cheney. And he is, I say with due respect, outnumbered. <laughs> well, listen, happy International Women's Day to oh, all yes. of you. As, a, as a son of a, a son of a single mom, as a father of a little girl, women's empowerment, where girls Ooh, are educated in women's empowerment around the world, extremism doesn't exist. Just, so I am amen. proud to be with four strong women this, today. That was great. Just oh, to great. let you know, every day is women's day. <laughs> But now we're going to especially acknowledge it. The today. president, yeah. just by the way, I left out, he, he weighed in on International Women's Day as well, citing that the uh, unemployment rate for women in this country is at an 18 year low. Well, again, where Malala Yousafzai, who won the Nobel mm -hmm. Peace Prize, shot in the head for going to school by the Taliban, mm -hmm. said the thing extremists fear the most mm -hmm. is a girl with the book. That's how we're going to get to the bottom of it. All right, let's All right. begin. The Washington Post reporting special counsel Robert Mueller's team is looking into a meeting that happened just before Donald Trump's inauguration. Among those present, George Nader, a United Arab Emirates advisor with alleged ties to the Kremlin, and Eric Prince, founder of the Blackwater Security Company and Trump campaign donor. This, as the New York Times is reporting, Mueller has also learned of two conversations in recent months in which President Trump asked former White House Chief of Staff Prince Priebus and White House Counsel Don McCann about matters they discussed with investigators. Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Harridge has all the details here. Catherine? Thank you, Sandra. Based on our reporting here at Fox News, we can confirm that special counsel has been looking at this issue of the United Arab Emirates and its contacts with the Trump administration until uh, September of last year, pardon me. And a short time ago on Capitol Hill, we heard from the House Intelligence Committee's ranking Democrat who said he wants to recall Eric Prince, who testified last year about one meeting in particular that was January 2017 in the Seychelles, a group of remote islands in the Indian Ocean. This Seychelles meeting uh, was part of an effort to establish a back channel to Russia that the meeting that Eric Prince had with the Russian uh, banker was not happenstance. Uh, is obviously at odds with what we heard in the testimony before the House Intelligence Committee. The committee Democrats want George Nader to testify as well. He's reportedly cooperating with the special counsel investigation about this meeting because he played a role setting it up in the Seychelles. Eric Prince told Fox that the meeting with a Russian businessman who had close ties to Vladimir Putin happened by chance and at the suggestion of the United Arab Emirates. And he also emphasizes that he was trying to build a relationship with the president at that time and did not have any kind of special access to create an alleged back channel with the Russians. The Seychelles meeting also goes to the heart of the unmasking controversy. That's the identification of American citizens in foreign intelligence reporting. Fox News can confirm that former National Security Advisor Susan Rice unmasked participants in the Seychelles meeting, and she also testified that she unmasked a December 2016 Trump Tower meeting. That included the president's son, the Crown Prince of the United Arab Emirates, and others. The Crown Prince is an important player in all of this because he has a close relationship with the Russian President Vladimir Putin. And Rice said she feared the meetings were evidence of this back channel between the incoming administration and Moscow, though the meeting was described to Fox News as an effort by the administration in good faith to build relationships during the transition. Also, you mentioned a source with knowledge of the investigation tells Fox News that the President did talk to Rance Priebus about his interview with the special counsel, but the the source said the conversation was limited to asking how it went and if they were treated, if he was treated fairly and responsibly, and it didn't really go into the substance of his testimony, Sandra. All right, a lot to get to there. Thank Catherine, yeah. thank you for all You're the welcome. updates. Uh, the colonel's on the couch. What do you what do you make of all these new developments okay. on the probe? Before we dive into Russia, 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 can I just say writ large, the Russians are not our friends. They don't care about Democrat, Republican. All they see is American, Americans, and the Americans are are our enemy from the Russian standpoint, and they just want to sow chaos. Putin couldn't be happier a year into us doing the machinations. On this, you know, on this individual meeting and down in the Seychelles, whether it was by happenstance, they just happened to be there, or whether the Emiratis set it up. We set up back channels all the time. It was post-election. Marie, you know we call it track two negotiations, where private sector citizens have uh, some type of dialogue. And the UAE had a special interest here because they want to drive a wedge 
uh, between Russia and Iran. They're very worried about uh, Iran. And if they could facilitate the new incoming president and, and, and Putin having a strengthening relations, that was in their interest. But I, think the I just point don't see much there there. And there's a difference between inappropriate, if you want to look at the timing of it, and illegal. But I think the point of the report is that Susan Rice lied to House investigators when she was asked, um, uh, she claimed to have no idea how the information about the meetings, which That's came from the unmasking in, of the intelligence reports, which she asked for, got to the Washington Well, she Post. may not know. I mean, she asked, she says she asked for the, for the American to be unmasked. The only one who would have had to been unmasked was the American, Eric Prince. She says she doesn't know how that got to the Post. A lot of people, Marie, more than you think, would have Marie, had access Marie, Marie. to this. What? No, you have no evidence. Working for the, no, no, you have no evidence Susan president. leaked it. You have no evidence right, but Susan leaked it. You can't president. just say oh, that one at a time because nobody can hear Unmasking was a very big deal. And when I worked there, it was too. We have seen now that Susan Rice has done it in droves, along with Samantha Power, and if they just blast it out to the community, which they, they did, they, they know the odds are that it's going to be leaked. Right. That's not true, though, because look, there were reasons to unmask these people. They were having meetings with foreigners. They were working to undermine American foreign policy, right. and and the normal channels for who got access to this unmasked information. Who knows who leaked Hold it? On, but I don't on, think it was Susan. Here. No, I'm troubled by this New York Times report for and not for the reasons that you might think. So they're reporting about Don McGahn telling mm -hmm. investigators the president once asked yeah. to him to fire the special counsel and then wanted to issue him to issue a statement denying a New York Times report and then the conversation with Reince Priebus. You take that and earlier you had the former Attorney General Eric Holder on Real Time with Bill Maher saying President Trump will face an obstruction of justice charge from the special counsel. Robert Mueller. You technically have an obstruction of justice case. I've known Bob Mueller for 20 to 30 years. My guess is he's trying to make the case as good as he possibly can. This looks like the New York Times trying to put pressure on the special counsel to me to come up with an obstruction of justice charge, even though him, the president having conversations with his own advisors, as, the, as Judge Napolitano said, that's not coaching a witness. He can have these conversations. And even the New York Times article goes into this, that uh, attorneys don't think mm -hmm. that this looks like, but it looks shady and it smells bad. Well, but that they're somehow trying to right. hear, well, did you know that they're trying to basically line up a case for the special counsel? And I, I find that to be seriously questionable. Look, I, I, the bottom line for me is there's the it's completely appropriate for the president to be talking to his staff afterwards. That is very different than what Bill Clinton was accused of, what Nixon did in coaching witnesses beforehand. And I think that's the, stink, the distinction we have to make. But talking to them afterwards, Maybe this, your point, maybe this is just a public campaign mm -hmm. uh, against the president um, and for some sort of obstruction, uh, obstruction of justice case. But if you start adding up what you're hearing right. uh, from the liberal leaning media and former administra uh, Obama administration officials, thumbs down. Right. We are just getting started. More to come. The chairman of the Democratic National Committee getting called out for inflating his party's fundraising numbers. What he said and what the facts really are ahead. Plus, Attorney General Jeff Sessions responding to growing calls for a special counsel to look into alleged Obama-era abuse of government spying powers during the 2016 presidential election. Can the investigators investigate themselves? General Sessions' answer. To look into alleged Obama-era surveillance abuses during the 2016 campaign, Attorney General Jeff Sessions responding to a letter from House Oversight Committee Chairman Trey Gowdy and House Judiciary Chair Bob Goodlatte asking him to name a second special, special counsel. Here's the Attorney General and exclusive interview with Shannon Bream. I have great respect for um, Mr. Gowdy and Chairman Goodlatte, and we're going to consider seriously their recommendations. I have appointed a person outside of Washington many years in the Department of Justice to look at all the allegations that the House Judiciary Committee members sent to us. They were worried that the Inspector General wouldn't have the same kind of access or subpoena powers to certain people who may not be under the reach of the DOJ as employees. What do you say to that concern? That's a uh, concern that I think is worthy of, of consideration, and we will consider that and are considering it, actually. Hmm. Interesting. I'll bring it out to the couch. What do you think? Well, again, to take a step back and put this in context, our FISA process is sacred. 
And that's what keeps, that's the firewall that keeps our massive intelligence apparatus, which is the best in the world. I've worked with them all over the world. Mm -hmm. And, and keeps them from looking at our own citizens. I mean, and this has been set up since the day of, days of J. Edgar Hoover, uh, who, when, who was abusing federal authorities in terms of looking at our own citizens. Mm -hmm. So that process is absolutely critical. I am all for taking a hard look at whether that process was abused. I personally was fine with the IG investigation uh, and, and what we were doing with that, but now folks have shifted uh, because of this scope issue and because of folks that uh, are no longer with the DOJ, no longer with the FBI, and maybe with other agencies. But I think we definitely have to take a hard look at it. Marie? Well, I think you can take a hard look at it in the Inspector General, and they're doing that. And so far, there has been no evidence that we have seen publicly. There have been accusations, but there hasn't been hard evidence that the FISA court behaved inappropriately. There have been a lot of accusations thrown around. But these FISA court officials and judges are bipartisan. I think almost all of them were appointed by Republicans. They run this process in a very uh, stringent way, and so if they're comes out that there was something done wrong. Let's look at that there's further. There's doubt. There's doubt. There's, that, but there's that doubt, doubt that's undermines. being seated, I think, in part for political reasons. I think in part it's to undermine the Russia investigation. Some people have legitimate concerns about FISA. That is true. But the inspector general can do this. Are no, you was, confident? Go ahead, Diggin. It was the manipulation of the FISA process by Democrats, where you go in and get a warrant to spy on an American citizen right. using a dossier that was funded by the Clinton campaign, that was funded by the Democrats. And even in that, demo, uh, that Democratic memo that was released, we know that that was used in part to get a warrant to, uh, to essentially spy on an American citizen. And we still don't yet know. And to that point, that the Inspector General can't talk to people who no longer work at the yeah. FBI. Where he he can't compel they can. them to testify. Well, he, he, can. he can't compel them yeah. to testify so, if they want to, FBI and DOJ. By the way, Bob Mueller could look at this. Well, if he's going to go down every rabbit hole, go down this That's what one. I was going to ask you, Marie. Based on what you just said, mm -hmm. right. are you suggesting that this would somehow discredit or damage the credibility of the Mueller probe? What I was, the point I was making is that I think some Republicans who are supportive of the president are trying to discredit the FISA warrant against Carter Page in order to discredit the entire Russia investigation. See, this was partisan. There's nothing there. It was a witch hunt. But, but, to but take, if Democratic partisans but, manipulated this but process, to we point, need to know. In order to be manipulated, then, these FISA judges who were almost all, I think, or all appointed by Republicans would have had to just fall prey to this. They knew that there were political, there was political partisanship. Well, but did they know? Yes, that's they what did. we have to know. They did. They did. They did. You're putting they, something as a footnote. They in the read all the footnotes, but, man. You know these there's, no. judges. If there's I read this the much doubt, no matter where it came from, <laughs> doesn't it need to be resolved? Because no matter where the doubt came from and no sure. matter what yes. the motivation was, yes. and I think a lot of people don't agree yes. that it was that it was sown in order to undermine the Mueller investigation, regardless of what happened, it's there. So now it yes. has to be resolved. And I, I think, think it the does have, and this is about trust on the part of the American people, and whether it goes to an IG or whether right. it goes to a special in, uh, investigator, this is where the American people trust their government that they have due process in place, that they're not okay. being fed uh, a bunch it, of garbage, it, and that... In that Democratic memo, there was no use of the word political, partisan, or campaign, much as Clinton or Democratic National Committee, in terms of what in was the disclosed. FISA application there All was, right. though. So. The battle just getting bigger. Democrats slamming Attorney General Sessions for the administration's crackdown on California's sanctuary law that protects illegal immigrants. Who will come out on top legally and politically? And the president. And she, she went out and warned them all, scatter. She's telling that to criminals. And it's certainly something that we're looking at with respect to her individually. What she did is incredible and very dangerous from the standpoint of ICE and Border Patrol. That's President Trump touting his Justice Department and taking a jab at Oakland's Democratic mayor over, as the debate over sanctuary laws heats up. This one day after, Attorney General Jeff Sessions was in California's capital to announce a lawsuit against the state over its sanctuary law, which enhances protections for those in the U.S. illegally. Much of the AG's criticism also directed at Oakland Mayor Libby Schaaf. So here's my message to Mayor Schaaf. How dare you, how dare you needlessly endanger the lives of our law enforcement officers to promote a radical open borders agenda? Mayor Schaaf 
firing back using Sessions' own choice of words. How dare you distort the reality about declining violent crime in a diverse sanctuary city like Oakland, California, to advance your racist agenda. Meantime, California Democratic Senator Kamala Harris says the Trump administration may be giving ICE too much power. ICE has a role. ICE should exist. But let's not abuse the power. Let's not extend it to areas that were not, um, that are not in the, the, posing a, a threat to the safety and the public safety of, of these communities. But the agency's acting director saying he and his agents are simply doing their jobs. We're not abusing our authority. We're, we're, we're enforcing the law. And what Camila Harris needs to understand is her facts. 89% of everybody we arrested the last fiscal year, that's nine out of every 10 aliens we arrested, did have a criminal history. When we look at California specifically, the last operation in Los Angeles, 88% of those were criminal aliens. You know, I've tried to meet with Kamala Harris and Diane Feinstein three separate occasions in the past two months to explain to them the facts of what ICE is doing. They've canceled every one of those meetings. They don't want to know the facts. This might be, Michael, the fight of the century for America and, and who gets to decide yep. um, what is immigration law in this country and who gets to decide whether illegal immigrants get to stay. Look, at my core, I'm a small government conservative. Uh, I don't want the federal government making you know, just blanket statements about issues. Uh, I'm all for local and state officials deciding things. But there's two things that are clearly a federal issue. Defending our country through our military and protecting our borders. You can't have individual states setting up its own immigration policy like California is going to do. And there's one statute in particular that really jumps out at me uh, that Calif the California legislature just passed, and that's making it for private biz business owners, I have my own business, making it illegal according to state law for them to work with federal immigration officials. And then finally, just on the sake of, for the sake of law enforcement, who are putting their lives on the line day in and day out. You know, in the military, at least we know when it ends when we come home. These guys are constantly mm. in a gray zone and having to deal with these uh, criminals and then to have your own state and local officials working against you, actively opposing, mm. I just find absolutely uh, egregious. Well, this is, I, I can see, you can see the Supreme Court justices going, gimme, gimme, yeah. gimme, because yeah. that one statute that Michael is talking about, Melissa, preventing private business owners from saying anything to immigration agents that seems to violate the first amendment and the and the supreme court just decided in 2012 that essentially that immigration law lies in the hands of the federal government that was Clearly. the arizona v the united states I, I mean i look at the supremacy clause i mean it's something that we all learned about very early yeah. in, in our in high school. In, in, yeah, yeah i mean where you just you can't ignore federal laws states can't come along and pass laws that undo federal laws it, it, county cities can't be doing their own thing especially on some thing that is, you know, like you said, is run primarily at a federal level. I mean, we're talking about immigration. You can't come immigrate to one town when it's against California federal law. California start issuing its own visas and have different rules at airports. It would just and, be right, total yeah. and complete chaos. Right. I, I think one interesting idea I heard earlier was to bring this mayor to Washington to try and defend her position to Congress. And I actually think that would be interesting and instructive if it could be a constructive debate well, you, where she talks about what, what she's mm -hmm. trying to do and kind of defends where she's coming from. It would be interesting Thing to see. Well, and Congress has the, the ha power to put pressure on these sanctuary cities and this sanctuary state through the power of the purse. You can attach, with future funding, you can attach strengths to that. It's you, you basically enforce the federal law or you, don't get a, you, or you don't get this amount of money. Well, Congress should actually take their jobs even broader, and they should look at comprehensive immigration reform. Yeah. I know that's not going to happen. We are in a midterm year. Michael's smiling at me like I'm ha <laughs> having my head in the clouds. Why? Hey, why not? But this is why, because... Such both, a decent deal on both the table. Sides oh, now, your job. 
Both sides have now run so far to each corner, and there were reports last night that the governor of California wanted to meet with Jeff Sessions, and Jeff Sessions said no, and now the head of Vice is saying Dianne Feinstein and Kamala Harris won't meet with him. No one's talking, and no one's actually looking at real solutions. Congress has an opportunity is. to do that. Yeah. The president's looking at real solutions. The president can't do it on his own. Here's a solution. You take a can. saw, and you go along the California border and saw it. Off and kick it right into the Pacific. <laughs> we have to find somewhere for wine then, I think. <laughs> that sounds good in the noon hour. Yeah, okay, so we're going to alert in here because One. Paul Man. As you can see, he's, he's showing up to... Uh, Someone's holding a sign that reads traitor. Okay. Um, he's the president's former campaign chief, and he faces charges including tax evasion as well as bank fraud. A grand jury indictment accuses him of hiding from the IRS tens of millions of dollars he earned advising pro-Russian politicians in Ukraine. The charges are part of special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation into Russian efforts to influence U.S. elections. So Paul Manafort, the president's former campaign chief, is now in that uh, northern Virginia courthouse. We'll see what happens there and bring it to you. Meantime, for the regarding his communications with Donald Trump after departing his campaign. It's unclear whether or not he will comply with those questions this time. tearing itself apart than Putin right now uh, in the Kremlin. So look, as soon as someone testifies, it's leaked. Let's just get through this investigation and let's you know, Congress do your job in a professional way. But let's get through it and let's this. Also joining me, the president's daughter-in-law, Laura Trump, senior advisor to Trump for America. I'll ask her about reports that the only person Team Trump is worried about in 2020 is former Vice President Joe Biden. Is that true? That and more over time atop the hour in a few minutes. Sandra? We look forward to it. Harris, thank you. Well, recent diplomatic...